Alright, hello everyone. If anyone's even watching live, welcome to the Connect Shop tutorial session. Streaming live on Facebook and Twitch. If you're watching on Facebook, I'd recommend switching to Twitch because it generally has better real time image compression. Um, and if you are one of my supporters on Patreon, navigate over now and you can download an example file that we'll be looking through later on in this session okay so we're going to talk about the basics of skeletal tracking with the connect I'll be using connect version 2 um, although the version 1 is usable in touch um, I don't use it so there you go most of this information should be, should be applicable to both. So you can add a connect shop in the typical way. I've already added one to this. And as you can see, if you are a person in the scene, you have channels representing the XYZ of various joints in your skeleton, as well as an ID channel. These are the default channels. There are many other channels that you can enable. I'll probably cover a little bit of that, but uh, some of those are kind of esoteric and this is more of a general purpose tutorial. So go, jumping back to the ID tag, that's super useful um, for when you want to know if anyone is in scene, which can be useful to disable certain things when someone leaves the scene. depending on what logic you're, you're using. Okay, so, as a simple example of how to use the connect shop, I generally will use a select to grab something I like. I put an underscore because if you don't, you also get hand tip, which if you're doing some gestural stuff that might might be useful. But for me, I, I generally just put the underscore so I get just hand L and hand R. Um, then, as an example, we could, I don't know, circle. My left hand. There you go. You might notice that we've got some mirror flipping going on. That is because the connect is giving you positions relative to its point of view, which is generally facing the opposite way as you are if it's facing you. Um, you can flip the skeletal direction parameter, which Oh, that, that, sorry, that only works if you're using UV space. So maybe, you know, I'll cover that. Um, the default is world space positions, which gives you uh, T, X, Y, and Z for every joint. There's also color space positions, which are mapping all the joint positions to line up with where they would be in UV space of your color image. Uh, you could also do it based on your, depths, uh, your depth image, which has a different aspect ratio and resolution. Uh, that can be useful if you're trying to do uh, real-time overlays into into your top world and have them line up pixel for pixel to some extent. Um, I think I'm going to save that for a later tutorial on working with more advanced topics between chop and top world. Um, anyway. I generally work in world space because I like to go 3D. Um, cool. So you can assign these channels to anything like you would um, with other chops. I'm assuming you already know about how to use chops. So one, one fun thing to do is if you want to get a representation of your skeleton for debugging purposes or whatever your purposes are um, 
instead of selecting hand, I could do select not ID. Confirm that I got that right. I didn't. Whoops. Star not ID. Uh, I always get confused with these. There you go. Okay. Could have also used a delete shot probably. Um, so here we have all of our joints. Right. Cool. So then we can shuffle them to make channels representing your X, Y, and Z. I'll generally do a rename, if not doing the rename here. Z, X, Y, Z. There we go. Nullify that chain. Cool. And now we can instance a little geometry. Let's go with the sphere. Typical. I will instance a geometry on every one of our joints so we can see what the hell's going on. Oh, instance enable. Select our channels. Maybe make this a decent size. One thing to be aware of is uh, if you've got a desk or whatever in front of you, sometimes your legs will do weird shit. <laughs> Part of my language. Weird stuff. Um, so when you sit down, or when I sit down, you can see my legs are as if I'm sitting on the floor, but that's just because they're not visible. There is a um, option for seated, but I still don't, I don't know if that even works. Anyway, I don't use that. Your results may vary, and if you have any tips on that, let me know, because... Uh, this is a mutual learning environment, and I do these tutorials as much for me to learn new things as y'all. So there we go. Um, and you could render this out like your um, like a typical setup, which just for the sake of it. Um, So as you can see, the skeleton is facing away from our camera. But as I said before, that's because the Kinect is facing me from the other side. So there's various techniques you could do. One is just to rotate about your y-axis. Um, other options are to um, flip various uh, ver uh, axes to be positive or negative, <clears throat> or rearrange the numbers in Chop World. Um, that can be useful for all sorts of things, but that's more of a Chop technique thing than Connect specific, so we'll kind of just leave that alone. Um, okay. So, I've gotten several requests of how to um, detect various poses and gestures. So let's let's get into that. Some of you may have seen my example, which is not open at the moment. Pose recognition. So let's just quickly save this out.
Gotta love that guy. Okay, so here I am. Let's jump into the teapot scene here. Oh, blast. Forgot. Okay. Forgot that my image is not in that scene. So it can detect. I've got some sort of interference going on in here. A constant problem with connect. And I can detect that stupid dance move called the dab. Takes a screenshot of you to embarrass you for doing something silly. So you may wonder how that's done. Let's take a look. So I've done a similar thing here with um, select shops, just selecting the various channels I'll need. Merge them together, put them in a null so they're all accessible where I need them. Uh, and when I did this, so then I just put that one null into your active mode so I could assign the translation channels to the translate parameters of a bunch of null components which may seem a little weird at first but there is this nifty chop called the object chop which you can use to get all sorts of information about the objects you have selected as your reference and your target um, so as you can see here I'm, I'm getting position data this one is hip a hip relative, head relative to hip, I guess you could say, since hip is the reference here. Um, and so that's what I'm using to to uh, figure out my tilt of the teapot side to side. Just the translation of my head over my hip shows you how far I'm leaning left or right, which then I multiply by 45, or negative 45 anyway, so you get a 45 degree rotation at whatever my maximum tilt is. So anyway, um, it's a little ahead of myself here. So actually when it comes to trying to recognize a pose, a pose is comprised of relations between your various joints to each other. So if, if you want to do I'm a little teapot, short and stout, here's my handle, here's my spout, tip me over, pour me out very fun. So basically, depending if you're doing right-handed or left-handed, you would want one of your hands to be on your hip. The other hand should be out to the side, and your elbow should be down below your hand. So here's where I'm checking the position of hand relative to elbow. Um, and then that it gets selected and then there's an expression if it's greater than zero so if my hand is above my elbow that is a true so if that happens and because I'm combining with a logic chop here in and mode and my hips distance from my hand or hands distance from hip is below a certain threshold which in this case I just by looking at what I was getting with my hand on my hip, 0.3 seemed to be approximately right. Might need to try this with people of different body shapes to really get what the best threshold is. Um, but this was just a quick example I threw together. So if both of those are true, you get a positive, um, or a, a one, true in the Boolean sense. And then. I use an OR because you don't want to have both arms happening at once, not that that's even possible. And then I'm also making sure that ID value is greater than zero. Um, because if there's not a person in the scene, all of your all of your connect values will come in as zero, zero, zero. 
and that will give a false positive to certain logic, such as distance between two joints being less than a certain threshold, you'll you'll get false positives, essentially. So, sorry, this is unscripted, folks. Okay, so if all the other conditions are true, and there is someone detected in scene, combine that in AND mode, then I put a trigger, which has a, a attack time, and I have disabled complete envelope, which is on by default. So basically what this does is it counts up, I'm in the pose there, you know what, for reference, let me, um, okay, so you can see me, All right, so as you can see, if I go in the pose and then lose it, the trigger chop, since it doesn't have complete envelope on, it won't finish its full ramp. So that way if I say am brushing up against my arm to then go do the dab move, or if you have a hundred things you're looking for, whatever, you need to hold a specific pose for however much time. So in this case, I have a um, 0.5 second um, time, and when that is reached, that triggers a one there, which can then trigger all the other animations. So I've got a lag here um, that will then feed the the fading in and out and what have you of whatever you're trying to trigger with whatever pose you're using. Of course, in this example, we've got the classic uh, Newell teapot, which everyone who does OpenGL stuff. I'm sure is super stoked to see yet again. Another thing I've done in this is to detect whether I'm doing my right hand or left hand as the spout and handle. So to do that, um, I'm comparing my my general triggering, which is here, with the the triggering of right side and left side. So the two things that I'm doing an or with, like I'm going here and comparing an and with the overall triggering that something is happening. Then I will, um, sorry, I'm, I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but this is a little complicated. But it's essentially, um, depending if it's right hand or left hand, that adds or subtracts 90 degrees from the initial rotation, which is 90. So as you can see here, the, the teapot's actually always running and my tilting is always controlling it. But depending which hand I put to the side, there you have it. So sorry if I'm not explaining the, this confusing extra bit uh, well in real time, but the main part is using the object chops. Um, you can also do this with math, just use, you know, Pythagorean distance uh, calculation equations. So sometimes if I need to, say, find the distance between hundreds of points, I'm not going to set up a bunch of nulls with like a replicator and then a bunch of object chops and then have to programmatically fill out all these parameters. You could also build with a bunch of chops a, a little Pythagorean distance uh, network that will calculate all the distances you need or whatever um, angles between points there's you know those equations are out there I'm not going to get into that now um, so yeah going back the two main things that you'd want to use for this type of um, pose detection would be finding distance between um, between two objects, which would be your joints of your or of your skeleton, and finding the relative position of one to another, so you can um, basically build out the relationships that that create a specific pose. 
and there you have how to recognize poses. Um, you can also use um, here. I'll, I'll give another example of, of some other things you can do once you have all these. Let's compare my two hands to each other. So you can get the distance between them and you could have this scale an object of some kind. Let's uh So that's fun. We can also make a copy of this and get, no, not the rotation, the bearing. Turn on smooth rotation, that sometimes helps. This one isn't, isn't the nicest with real-time tracking data, but it, it's a, at least fun and sometimes actually quote-unquote works. Not the best, but it's okay. Um, as you can see, my dark teapot is kind of interfering with our whole shebang here. Um, and you can you can use these these values to control anything. I've been working on a project recently where the various distances between points are uh, and orientations between points and whatnot are controlling synthesizer parameters to make weird sound effects. Um, we can go into that in a later video, perhaps. Tip me over, pour me out. There you go. So quickly to look at, at the other ones. This is my yoga detection. Close that out. See me in this one. And again, none of these are perfect, just threw them all together. One thing I noticed, it's kind of interesting how how beautiful you can make a touch network be, uh, especially with something like yoga detection, which is all about form. Anyway, so I was trying to do the tree pose. So with the tree pose, your one foot has to be up on the other knee, so I'm comparing their distance. Um, and your hand your hands are supposed to be up over your head so I'm just making sure that my elbow is approximately the same height as my head or higher because they oh, there you go uh, so here here you can see actually a problem where I'm getting a false positive for my feet being my foot being close enough because it's all out of frame so the values coming in are to some extent spurious, if you will. Um, oh, shouts out to Kai who just pledged ten dollars on Patreon. Thank you very much. And while we're at it, may as well give a shout out to my other supporters. Uh, big shouts to Raphael Pilot, Tom Vidicock. I don't know how to pronounce that. I believe it's French. Winston Ray and Giovanni Jensen, thank you very much for your support. And there will be more example files for you and anyone else who decides to join posted after this. And our next topic of discussion, which will be encoding hand velocity in feedback for displacing geometry, the file for that is already up. So if you want to download that now, be ready for when we jump into that, go ahead. Um, Anyway, so as I was saying, I'm getting some false triggering of my feet being close. So you can, I mean, ideally you'd be using this in an installation where you're not having users sitting in front of a computer desk with a laptop screen blocking the connect partially. But anyway, you can, there's lots of other things, checks and balances, if you will, that you can build into your logic to catch exceptions essentially 
So similar to how I'm I'm doing an ID check to make sure that a player is actually recognized as being in the scene before any of the other stuff can trigger anything down the chain. Because this is an AND operator, even if everything else is triggering because the values are wrong, if there's no one in scene, you're still good. Um, in the process of preparing for this, I've actually learned a lot about logic chops. Uh, so the teapot example, for instance, has some stuff that I'm using expression chops. It turns out I could have just done completely in the logic. Anyway, um, again, that's intermediate and advanced chop talk, not for this tutorial. So as I said, we got to find the distance between the knee and the foot. Make sure it's below a certain threshold. That threshold. I found to be 0.45. Um, I also put in a lower bounds of 0 0.01 just in case I'm getting weird data. Hopefully that would catch it, but as you can see, oh, I guess it's kind of catching it. There you go. And then we need elbows above head, and I'm using the same tilt detection I was before for the teapot to visualize how good or bad your balance is when you're standing on one foot in the I don't even know how to pronounce this properly because I as you can tell I'm not actually very good at yoga Riksasana so similar to the other network um, you have your logic here that adds or ends all of your sub triggers that goes along triggers a ramp that has to count up so you have to hold it for a certain amount of time before it triggers and then with a number of lags I um, scale scale up the Vrksasana geometry untwist it so it, using a math, I've, I've, um, when the value is low or zero, everything gets ranged. I guess when, when the value is zero, zero, the thing is twisted 360 degrees, and then when all the logic evaluates to true, a one, it unfurls out to only a 33 degree twist or bend. I guess it's bend type, um, which. In general, you know, manipulating SOPs in real time is not advisable, but I've got a good CPU and there's only a, a little bit of stuff, so I'm still holding 60 frames easy. And then I've got an L system here where I'm driving the count of generations by the logic. So when logic jumps up to true of 1, that actually is multiplied by 10, so I get a 0 to 10 ramp thanks to the lag. And if I trigger it here, you can see the generations kind of unfurl, which is super cute. Um, so if any of you out there who are watching this are yoga aficionados, maybe we could team up on figuring out the various ratios and relationships between the joints for each pose and make a yoga recognition library or an interactive installation or an interactive whatever could be fun okay so we're coming up to the half hour mark here thanks all of you who have tuned in doesn't seem like there's any questions so far so either I'm a really good teacher or <laughs> <laughs> Y'all aren't paying too much attention, which, whatever. I'm happy to answer questions post facto as well. Um, no need to save this. Let's jump to hand velocity encoding and feedback. So for those of you who um, are my supporters, you can get this file now. Uh, everyone else, you can follow along and build your own similar system so let me just jump up here for the sake of you being able to see what I'm actually doing I'll add another connect top in ah, 
Come on. So this is a very similar setup to another one that several of you asked for tutorials about how to do this technique. Um, the example I'm referring to is a bunch of vertical bars that are kind of shiny like chrome and as you move your hand side to side the bars get displaced and then slowly deform back. This is a very similar thing. I think it actually looks a little cooler than my original example. Um, so here we have a bunch of instant spheres that as I kind of do this come hither pulling towards me gesture they'll get closer and closer until they break free of their magnetism gravity whatever you want to call it and then they there we go really pull them out of out of the way and then they kind of recede back to where they were and you kind of do cabbage patch whatever your dance moves are it's kind of weird to be doing with a headset on just cable flipping and flopping everywhere hopefully the audio didn't get messed up check check looks like it's still good okay so how did I do that you may wonder um, well let's take a look here we have some typical stuff um, oh I set this one up something I forgot to cover earlier is that the connect defaults to one player mode but I built this one to work with up to the maximum of six players that means 12 hands um, of course it's just me right now but you know maybe I can get my roommate out here in a few minutes um, so it's almost impossible to even zoom in to see all the channels because there's so many of them but you know, here's your same old stuff Um, yeah, so I did a little bit of math here, you don't necessarily need to do that, that's just specific to this scene. Anyway, the, the important thing is to find the velocity and encode that into feedback. So this is similar to in the Connect Top tutorial stream I did, how we were rippling a bunch of instance geometry in a grid based on my silhouette but that wasn't encoding anything to do with velocity. That was strictly kind of position based. So let's take the uh, derivative. I guess that's a pun intended. Um, or you might call it the slope. Basically find the velocity. There is a slope chop, but sometimes it can be a little finicky and idiosyncratic, if you will. Uh, sometimes it has to do with various time slicing. As you can see, the connect data is coming in time sliced. So depending what you're doing, sometimes it makes sense to shift it. And then sometimes you need to trim because the sample count sometimes fluctuates between um, one and two samples. I'm not actually sure why that is. Uh, and if any advanced users are watching this, I would love to know. And I'll probably end up asking one of you in my free time. Anyway, the easiest way to get the um, the velocity, if you will, is to just find the difference in position between current sample and previous sample. So to do that, I take a delay, just a one sample delay, uh, I found that you want your max delay to be bigger than the delay you're doing. Sometimes it glitches out if you have it just be one sample. Maybe that's in a cache top. I don't know. I, anyway, I always try to make sure I have a little bit of overhead just for safety. Um, two samples of a buffer is not going to kill you unless you've got a bunch of other stuff going on, at which point you probably need to look elsewhere for optimization. Anyway, current frame, previous frame. Combine chops, subtract. So that gives you the difference, which uh, looks like it's fluctuating a lot, but those are 0 .00 something. Um, but then if I move, you can you can see they fluctuate more. Anyway, um, so you take you have the velocity now and the positions. Um, 
Just a little bit of shifting here to clean up the, val the values a little. And then I rename them all to just be TX's, TY's, and TZ's. And I had I had to do this wackadoo thing here because of the way that I'm um, filling all these parameters. So I'm I'm doing a little trick here where I'm using the the digit of each one's names, which is me.digits in Python, as a way to select which channel it's looking at. There's other ways to go about this, and if you really wanted to optimize, you'd do it all in shops with exports. But for ease of use, and because I don't have too much uh, CPU overhead as it is, um, easy enough to do it with Python. So essentially, I had to make... Um, how do I describe this? I basically had to make it so that all the channel numbers would correspond to numbers of the circles. And then also, I did that ID check thing as we did before, so that circles that represent hands of users who aren't in the scene have an opacity, or alpha, of zero. So that, that was actually the really confusing part because there's two hands per player ID. So I actually had to use a select, select each ID twice, which is using me.digits. So you have player one ID and then player one ID again, then merge those all together. Um, and then rename them to be one through 12 because you got 12 hands. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And if not, I'm happy to clarify. So post now or later, I'll get to you. Um, oh, what was that? Thank you, Jason. I'm glad you like my teapot. OK, so now you saw the little silly workaround there. Let's jump into here and look at my hands. Um, so their RGB values are being encoded by the VXYZ channels that I've made here. Uh, one thing to note is that these values are, are signed, floating points, so when, when I'm moving in a negative direction you actually get negative values. Um, so you won't necessarily see any pixels here because I'm doing these these are all 32-bit float pixel format so that negative values can actually come in so it will, it'll just be black as far as we're seeing but if I'm moving in other directions you can see a bit of color there um, I really flail about you gotta move pretty fast to get get enough luminance to see on this uh, I guess it's downsampled viewer. But what's important is that data is now in, in pixel land and it can be encoded into a feedback trail. Uh, we covered the basics of making a feedback trail uh, in previous tutorial and that's, that's discussed all over the place and if you want to know more about it you can also go to, uh, where is it, image filters, there's a feedback example in the palette as well as a feedback edge example which is kind of like reaction diffusion and I know a lot of you are interested in that so definitely check that example out anyway back to the topic at hand um, here we have a feedback loop which as you can see is encoding the trails and then if I wipe back over the other way it kind of writes what looks like black over them but that's actually negative RGB values which once we go down the chain and down res a bit so that we don't lose all performance we will convert it to channel data so it seems a little weird to be going from channel data into you know top rasterized image data and then back into channel data but here be before you know you just have specific points it's all discrete but then it's encoding into a circle that has a known radius and a known softness which I'm controlling all from one constant for convenience sake. Um, 
oh, a brief aside, I'm also checking to see if the resolution changes and then doing uh, a reset pulse for feedback. Because sometimes if, when you change the input resolution, the feedback stays the same and stuff gets wackadoo. Anywho, um, so the reason, the reason to bring it into top world and do feedback and then bring it back into chop world is that you get the, the nice smoothing effect where shapes kind of are created and then smoosh back to where they used to be, which is basically because in my feedback, the opacity each time it feeds back over is only 99% of what it was before. So things just kind of slowly fade away. Uh, which goes without saying to people who use feedback all the time, I don't know if you, the viewer, is one of those people or not, but there you go. Sorry if it's redundant. Um, and then another thing I'm doing here is creating um, two ramps that go f that go from um, a negative to a positive value of R and G, which represent X and Y. So that basically just gives us the position, the the, the rest position of each instanced um, sphere. And then that ends up getting added with our displacement data uh, here, which you can see, which may seem a little weird at first, but um, you know you got your rows and your columns and your Z. Boom, super cool. All right. So then this all starts to become very similar information to what we covered in the first Connect um, tutorial where we were using instancing and feedback. So our TXYZ makes sense, um, RGB just for the sake of it. But these TX, Y, and Zs are really also RGBs at, at the... Uh, in reality, but in my top two, I've I've changed my R, G, and D names to be T, X, Y, and Z, um, which seems a little weird at first. But if you get the idea of encoding X, Y, and Z as R, G, and D, it all makes sense. And once I tell you, once you get that, things really start opening up. Uh, Matthew Reagan has a few really good examples. Um, that he's posted where you can you can pump <coughs> excuse me where you can pump uh, geometry and imagery into into shader world and do all sorts of manipulations way more efficiently than you would in sop world um, and there's other examples on the forum and on the Facebook help group um, and for instance the connect point cloud gives you RGB as XYZ so that could be used in this as well. Um, but yeah, it's super fun. And then my roommate Tom, who some of you may know from the forums as Diatom, was uh, watching me play with this and he was saying it would be fun if the particles, or you know, instance geometry, whatever you want to call them, if they behaved more like particles at some point. Because this is kind of a nice, graceful, gradual look but the beauty of you know having little spherical objects is that that they can be fun particles. So I did a little trick here where um, if the blue value is above a certain threshold, that will allow some noise, which you know you've got RGB representing X Y Z into the mix, which will then get added to our displacement map. So watch in here, if I really start flinging around, you'll start to see um, the blue value gets above a certain level and the balls break away and then they start to kind of have a weird particle motion to them which is dictated by this noise. There you go. But that's not really connect related. 
but it's fun. Um, yeah. So that is the the trick of encoding velocity into a feedback trail to do all sorts of stuff. So in theory you could be using this as a displacement map that runs in a shader that has you know hundreds of thousands of particles that are kind of just floating in a, in a certain area and then when you fling around they'll start to flow based on kind of like essentially you're laying down a vector field so use that for whatever you want that's kind of uh, based on your experience level with shaders or whatever whatever the hell you're doing you could probably run that and do some crazy CUDA physics stuff I've not been able to get that to compile on my machine yet but apparently touch 99 supports a newer version of CUDA anyway that is very off topic so I guess the last thing that might be worth covering uh, sure, let's save this, why not? is a couple other little things in the connect shop itself that I don't necessarily use all the time but they're I guess worth looking at. And of course all this stuff has been documented by other people before um, there's lots of great documentation out there. I've always been inspired by uh, how much information Matt Reagan and uh, Elbers, sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong, so Krabi, uh, post, amongst others, uh, if I'm not remembering your name on the spot, I'm sorry, but all of you are great, and that's how I learned. Uh, so, anyway, there's, oh, and of course the wiki and the forum and the Facebook group. Anyway, there's a bunch of things in here that we didn't really go over. Status channel. Uh, this can help you if if you're trying to build, trying to build some stuff where you really want to be checking if the data that you're getting is considered uh, valid. So I'm pretty sure what this does is lets you know how many, how sure it is uh, about about the tracking of whatever thing. Um, don't really use that. There's face tracking, which is uh, a little glitchy. It could be because I'm wearing headphones. Um, I've definitely used it before. It's it's okay. It's pretty jumpy, but it's useful. Uh, a more advanced technique is to use your your bone rotations and lengths to drive uh, some sort of skeleton system to deform uh, an avatar of, of some kind. That's definitely an advanced topic that I'm still learning myself, so we're not going to go into that yet, maybe in a month or two. <laughs> um, I mentioned earlier about color space positions. What's Let's quickly see if I uh, oh, God damn it, if I remember how this works. Just for the sake of it. Uh, hand R. So it gives you a U and V, but it still gives you the Z. Presumably you would you maybe use that for scaling something, so Let's do that. And we'll add a connect top to overlay onto. This is in color space, so let me add my color camera. Cool. Um, if I recall from the last time I did this, Numbers need to be rearranged a little, so let's be sure to put a null here before we export our values so we can do some math. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but a trick is if you drop onto the parameter name itself, it'll populate all the parameters within that, and then you just have to change one letter instead of dragging the whole thing again. Sometimes that's useful. 
Yes. So these values come in as a normalized 0 to 1, but um, the UV parameters of a circle, uh, a circle top and most tops, are based on a negative 1 to 1 uh, range. Super easy to fix that by the math. Um, make sure it only applies to things in the UV space. Uh, let me make sure I did that wildcard right by just... Yeah, okay, so that's not affecting UV. Cool. So we would just give it a 2 range of negative 1 to 1 with its from range staying at 0 to 1. Um, let's make the radius a lot smaller for now. Interesting. See, this is <laughs> this is one reason I don't mess with this so much. Maybe I needed to do point five here. There we go. So you can use this for nice simple overlays. Let's uh Let's maybe rearrange our Z as well. Add another math. Sometimes I'll like to rename these based on what channels they're actually applying to. So that'll be math UV. This will be math Z. Keep it nice and neat here. Um, All right, so Z, what's our, our radius now? 0.1. So 0.1 is probably the biggest we'd want it. And when it's 0.1, our Z value is about 0.5. Then the far away gets to maybe 2. So we will rearrange from 0.5 to 2 to be... 0.1 to 0 0.01 maybe. Oh, crap! Forgot to actually put Z. Okay, now it's only applying to our Z channel. And <laughs> it does help to actually export the parameter. Okay. Oh yeah, representing data set. There we go. So you could you could use that for whatever whatever purposes. Uh, if you wanted to be doing some basic puppetry, or you know, you could be drawing a feedback trail. That oh, that's a fun fun idea. Let's do that while we're at it. I'll make even smaller smaller okay we'll give it some softness cool and then um, wipe that out let's just use the feedback from our palette why not if I recall, it kind of bugged out on me last tutorial. Let's see if it worked out. It have worked out this time. Eh. What's wrong? It's so strange. Why doesn't it like... Ridiculous. There we go. Oh, it's an alpha thing. Okay. Cool, and then do a quick add. Great. So yeah, that's super fun. 
Um, any other connect stuff that makes sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess just do a couple face examples too. Why not? We'll make this an hour long thing. So I'll spend about five more minutes, then it'll be nine o'clock and we'll be done. So if you're watching this far, bravo. What do we have here? Let's look for I. So we have I, I close. Uh, copy, copy that data, or those nodes, I should say. So we'll be doing the same sort of remapping there. Um, cool. Left I U, left I V. This will be the right eye. So it's kind of interesting. Not perfect, but um, if someone's posing for a picture, maybe it'd be good in a photo booth. Do some sort of um, Snapchat style thing, whatever. There's lots of workflows for that. Uh, so, yeah, as with everything with Connect, it's not perfect, but it's pretty decent. Um, any last things to do here before we hit the hour mark? Yeah, I think that's about it. Let's jump back into our. Uh, I'll save this and uh, connect UV space. I'll I'll compile all these into uh, another example file for y'all a little later. All right. So as you can see, I still haven't perfected the logic. It triggers even though I'm not in the scene when the scene first starts. But here I am. Wasted. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to call it. For now, uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask, and I will try to make everything clear. All right, thank you very much. And once again, if if you want to get access to all the various example files, head on over to Patreon and jump on my bandwagon, if you will. Um, and you'll get some exclusive previews of projects I'm working on that can't be published yet if you're into that. Anyway, uh, thanks again, and I'll see you sometime soon, probably two Wednesdays from now. Stick to the every other until someone suggests otherwise. All right, signing off. This is Cut Mod. Thank you very much. <laughs>